Well, good morning to you. Welcome to Kerry this morning. It's great to be together. Uh, school holidays, hot day, but just so good to be together. Uh, my name is Peter Scott. I serve here as a senior pastor. If you are new, if you, uh, this is your first time, a special welcome to you. Uh, great to have you with us. We hope you enjoy your time. Um, we, on Sunday mornings, come together to worship our Heavenly Father. Uh, and to hear from him as we hear uh, today Sarah will be speaking and as we sing songs as we read the word. And it is good to do that together every week. So great to have you with us. Uh, as we start, a few things about, uh, we call it church news, a few things that are happening. Uh, the first one, it is still kind of dark in here. And so just to give you a little update, the lights are being worked on. Because it is school holidays, this is the time where lights are being worked. Uh, and we hope that, anticipate that next week uh, the lighting will be sorted out. And so it'll be a little bit lighter for us uh, entering the services. One thing I did want to mention to you, you might see on the floor near you or as you've come in, either some carpet squares or some tape. If you're able to just leave those where they are, please, they have been put in place this week by the people doing the lights as sort of markers. So if you're at all able to just uh, leave those things, that would be great for and helpful for them. So thank you. That's the lighting. Uh, some things coming up. In two weeks' time, we're excited that we're going to start our alpha time together. So uh, if you haven't been here the last few weeks, what we're planning to do is to run the alpha course, and I'll share what that is in a moment, uh, each week over the 10 weeks of this coming term. So we'll start on the 21st of April and things will look a little different. As you come in, you'll actually arrive for breakfast, we hope, at 9am and we'll have some breakfast for you. And then we'll be sitting together through the service on tables. And the idea of that is to allow us to connect with each other better and we'll be having lots of discussion time through the service. So we're really looking forward to Alpha. We have handed out over the last few weeks, and we have some at the back if you want to grab some more, little cards for you to invite people along to our uh, time together doing Alpha. Uh, because what is the Alpha course, and many of you know this, uh, Alpha is a program that was developed um, quite a number of years ago, but it's been run all over the world. Millions of people have done it, and many, many thousands of people have come to know Jesus through it. It's a process that allows you to ask questions about life, about meaning. And so we're going to do that together. Uh, there'll be some video messages, plenty of time, as I say, for discussion. And just to let us explore what do we believe as Christians. Tremendous opportunity. Go and search Alpha, uh, I think alpha.org or alpha.org.au if you want to look up more for yourself. But we're looking forward to that, looking forward to you inviting friends, neighbours, family, and to welcoming them for our, our season of Alpha. The next thing to remind you or to share with you, if you haven't heard this before, is we have a church camp coming up. First time we've had a church camp for quite some time. Uh, we were planning one, incidentally, for uh, I think it was 2020. Had a whole bunch of plans in place. And then, of course, good old COVID came along. So that was the end of that. So we finally decided this is the year and we're going to have a church camp. You are all welcome and invited. Uh, if you scan that QR code, if you go to our website, you'll be able to find more details. It's on the weekend of the 31st of May through to the 3rd of June. So that's a long weekend. And that weekend, we won't actually have a service here. And so if you are not able to make camp, we'll be inviting people to head to Forestdale campus or to another church, uh, but we would love to see you there. On cost, so cost is always a factor, there's time and there's cost. What you'll find when you go to the website is an offer of a 25% or a 50% reduction in the cost. And we want to offer that to you. There's no catch, there's no qualification requirement. What we're, trying, what we're seeing is that if you're just paying for one person, it seems reasonable and the cost is actually really reasonable because it's all included with food. But if you're paying for a family, it starts to add up. And so we wanted to recognise that we would prefer for you to be able to come and take those discounts. So if uh, it enables you to come, if that finance is a question, please take advantage of one of those discounts. Uh, sign up for the camp. We need to start getting our numbers ready. So we, uh, we look forward to you doing that. The last piece of church news that I've got, and we've been sharing this for a few weeks as well, uh, we have a, a thriving basketball club. Uh, a number of teams, I think we've got five or six junior teams at the moment, a couple of adult teams, and our fabulous president and secretary, Joe and Brendan Clark, uh, will be 
Do you hang up your boots from basketball? I'm not sure. That's a football expression. Anyway, they will be finishing their season as the president and secretary of the club at the end of this semester, at the end of this season of basketball. And so we are looking for church partners who might be interested in stepping into those roles. Uh, Why church partners? Because as a club, it's not just about the basketball. It's actually about being a ministry. And so we have some... Um, we'd really like people to lead the club who are deeply invested in God's mission and ministry as part of Kerry. You don't have to know much about basketball. We have coaches, we have committee members who know that, but we'd love to hear from you if you're at all interested or if there's something in you that says, oh, I reckon I, reckon I could do that for a season. Please come and see me. I'd love to talk to you. All right, we're going to move into singing with our fantastic team in just a moment. Uh, I'm going to pray before that though and what I would like to pray about is our tithes and our offerings, our giving. Uh, Each week many, many of you give online and it's great to pray and say, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be part of what you're doing as we give. Now, if you've brought cash or you'd like to give today and you're not aware, we've got a little giving box box up the back and on the website, we've got all of the electronic details for giving. Um, So we'll let you sort that out at your convenience. But right now, let's just pray over uh, our stewardship of what God has given us and then we'll move into a time of worship. Heavenly Father, thank you. And in fact, Lord, before we pray about finance stuff, we just say thank you that we can gather this morning together in your name. Thank you for the hope that you have given us. That means we want to be here to worship you, to hear from you. And thank you for the sense of being together in that. It's not an isolated thing, but we do it as a community, as a body of yours. So thank you for this time together. Father, we pray this morning over the financial uh, aspects of our lives. Thank you for what you have given us. And thank you that you allow us freedom to steward what you've given us. Lord, as we give back this morning, as we tithe electronically or uh, in, in cash today, thank you so much for all that you've given us. And we give back with grateful hearts. May what we've given, Lord, be used for your glory and your kingdom. And so we thank you for that too. And Father, as we now move into a time of worshipping you, would you open our hearts, no matter how we've come this morning, no matter what's been going on in our weeks, would you give us and help us to move into a place where our entire focus is on you and your glory and your majesty, on who you are, that we might worship you with all of our hearts and all of our minds, because you are worthy. Thank you. Amen. Would you stand with us? that our God, our King, can conquer any battle. Oh, 
Jesus does not
This tree is over 300 feet tall, estimated to be at least 600 years old. And that's nothing. There are trees towering over this forest that were just seedlings when Christ was walking on the earth. How deep do you think the roots are on a tree like this? 100 feet, 1,000 feet? The truth is a tree this tall can't grow roots deep enough to support itself. That is why redwoods have intertwining roots. They support one another. These trees literally do for each other what they can't do alone. I think Jesus demonstrated that same mindset for us, that we're all in this together, supporting one another. I mean, think about it. He never just passed somebody by leaving them stuck. Jesus was constantly intertwining his life with those he came in contact with. He called people out of obscurity to join him in his journey of changing the world. He healed a blind man with mud. He restored a chronically ill outcast with merely the hem of his garment. He renewed one woman's hope for second chances and, and reminded a Pharisee of his need for mercy instead of morality. Jesus' ministry was constantly intertwined with people, connecting with them on the most intimate levels and changing their lives forever. Jesus called his followers to love people the way that he loved them, to bring health to the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, touch the untouchables, and as you have been treated generously, so live generously. And that call hasn't expired. Yeah, his charge to the church is just as clear today as ever. Therefore, may we be rooted in Christ, intertwined with one another, so that we may continue his mission. Isn't that just magnificent? I would love to go and walk in that redwood forest one day. I hope you've enjoyed, if you've been with us for the last few weeks, the, uh, those guys, they're called the skit guys, who've done these little videos that we've watched. Um, and the skit guys are often really funny. This was a much more uh, sort of just serious, uh, positive, not positive, but a serious rather than attempting to be comic presentation that's taken us through up to Easter and through Easter. And now this is the last video in this series. It's called The Road to Easter and Beyond. And the thought that they leave us with there is the idea that Jesus has called us to be community, just as God is community himself, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, that Jesus calls his followers, uh, and I love that image of the redwoods, they can only stand when they're together because their roots are intertwined. And that's the sort of analogy that they're using for us. I want to read briefly out of Paul's letter to the Corinthians because it also talks about us being a body. So I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. And Paul says this, he says, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, all its many parts form that one body, and so it is with Christ. For we were all baptised by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And then a couple of verses later on, he says... In fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. And it makes me think as we come this morning and we're about to join together in communion, it makes me think that God has drawn each one of us into this body today. God draws us together in communion. And that's a beautiful thing to remember as we together take the bread and the cup today, remembering what Jesus has done for us. 
And so we'll do that together in a minute. Uh, interesting to me that just before reading, uh, just before this passage where Paul wrote about the body being together, he's written about the process and what we do as we come together to remember Jesus. And so I want to read that part for us as well. And there's a sense, I think, in this passage that the, the two are connected, that the way we do this is supposed to be doing it together. So this is just earlier in chapter 11, also in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. And he's explaining the process, and he says this. He said, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so that's what we're about to do together. Paul also says that just before you do that, we should spend some time just reflecting thinking about the gift that God has given us and thinking about his calling to us and how we're carrying that out. And so I want to give us just some time to be quiet and still. I don't know what your life is like, but I suspect for many of you like me, it's just busy and it's constant. And the precious moment to just be quiet and still before the Lord is important and good. And this is a time for us to do that. And I invite you in that time to do what Paul calls a self-examination. A process of saying, Lord, where have I missed the mark? To say sorry for some of the things that you know you've done that you shouldn't. To say sorry for things you haven't done which you should have. And just to come before his grace and mercy in this moment, before we take the cup and the bread, which is which are the symbols of what he's done for us. So let me just give us a minute. Just be quiet in our own time with God. And then I'll lead us through taking the bread and the cup. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you and say sorry. We confess our sins. And we thank you. We thank you for your son. We thank you for his body that was broken and this wafer that we're about to take that represents that. And we thank you for his blood that was shed as represented by the cup that we're about to take part in together. And so with great thanks for these things, Father, we come before you in the name of your Son and accept your grace and your mercy to us. Thank you. Now, if you have not used one of these delightful little devices before, uh, just take a moment to carefully... <laughs> Uh, take the first bit of the top off uh, and then the second bit. So there's two layers. And it's quite interesting as I've led us through this, I've heard some of you proactively doing that right through the last sort of three or four minutes, and that's fine, that's good. Uh, but I'm going to have to do that because I can't do that with one hand, so just give me a second. <laughs> This is where I should have pre-done this. Hold on.
Thank you very much. All right. We have given thanks. So this bread, this wafer, represents Jesus' body that is broken for us. And he said, take this and do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat this together. And the cup is his blood. It represents his blood shed for us and bringing us into a new covenant that brings us the hope that we'll be talking about more today. Let's drink this together in remembrance. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for this, this time together, this symbolic way of remembering and communion with you that we do together. We praise you. Amen.
Thank you for the love you have poured out on us through the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. Remind us that whatever comes our way, that your love and your grace is greater than any challenges that we will face. Thank you. Thank you, God, for your continued presence in our lives and for being our only source of hope and strength forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. We've got three readings this morning. The first from 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18. Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Then Romans 8, verses 18 to 25. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And then Revelation 21, verses 1 to 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. Thanks, Miranda. Good morning, church. My name's Sarah Bagley. I'm on the pastoral uh, team here at Kerry, and it's my privilege to bring you the message today. Um, We're continuing our series on hope this morning with the final message titled, Hope in the Restoration of All Things. Now, by definition, things typically need restoration when they have experienced damage, decay or deterioration over time. And I'm sure most of you would agree with me that the world that we live in right now is in pretty poor condition. Since sin entered into the world all those thousands of years ago, the world has been deteriorating at a rate that seems to be unstoppable. And it's affecting every aspect of human existence and creation itself. There's an argument for global warming, for overpopulation, we're running out of resources for the rate at which we're using them. If we look at humanity, there seems to be an increased rate of disease and cancer and illness. New viruses are evolving rapidly, which pose a threat to humanity, and we've seen that in the last few years with COVID. 
And if we look at the world and the wars that are happening, the famine that's plaguing some countries, the natural disasters, the earthquakes, the flooding, uh, and the chaos that that brings to communities, some of us would say that the future looks pretty bleak uh, for humankind and for the world as we know it. If you just turn on the news, it's not a surprise that people live with fear for the now, in fear of the future, that people live with anxiety, and that there are some people who even experience complete hopelessness. But I actually want to bring you some hope this morning. The condition of the world is not a surprise to God. He knew the effects of sin on his creation and he already has a plan to bring restoration. He has a plan to make all things new and that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So talking about new things, all right, we're going to do some arm exercises this morning. It's like up and down. Okay, I'm going to ask some questions and I would love for you to respond because this is always fun. Uh, Who here likes to get new things? Yeah, work those arms, work those arms. All right, who here has the love language of gifts? Do you guys know about the five love languages? Yeah, there's a few of you. You feel loved when someone gives a gift. That's cool. Anyone here needing a new phone? Oh, a few of you as a couple. Yeah, what about a new computer? Anyone do with a new computer? Yeah, where's Pastor Pete? I can't see him, but he needs a new computer. There you are. Did you put your hand up? He needs a new computer and a new phone. Just, you know, if you've got an extra few thousand, just pass the pizza over there. Um, so change of season. Who needs some new clothes? Yeah, this time of year always stresses me out. I go to the shops. The clothes never fit me. They're always too long, too tight. <laughs> I don't like to uh, spend any money. Anyone else have them feels? Yeah, yeah, that's me. I know some of you actually love shopping, so that's cool as well. What about a new car? Anyone do with a new car? Oh, he puts his hand up for that one. <laughs> yeah, not many. Oh, look, yep, a couple of us. Do you guys, um, it would be pretty cool if I was able to give everyone a new car this morning. That would be pretty cool. Um, but do you guys remember the time that Oprah Winfrey gave out new cars? Yeah, if you are like younger than 30. You probably don't remember because it happened 20 years ago in 2004. But it is such a fun clip. So I've actually downloaded it and we're going to watch it this morning. Everybody in the audience, now listen to me carefully, is being given a special package and I don't want you to open it. Do not open it. Cameras are on you, so do not open until I tell you. All right, open your boxes. Open your boxes. One, two, three. So that's pretty fun, hey? That's pretty fun. Our 276 Pontiac G6s were given out. Very cool. Unfortunately, (laughs) even though you guys were really super generous at Giving Sunday, our church budget still doesn't stretch for me to be able to give you all new cars. So we're not able to do that this morning. But I think I have something better. All right. So my next question is, Who here would like a new body? Yeah, there's quite a few of you. Now, perhaps the one that you have is full of aches and pains. Maybe it struggles to do what you need it to do. Maybe it's getting older. You've got some wrinkles you're not that fond of. Maybe you've got some age spots happening. Maybe things are sagging a little bit. Body parts aren't quite in the same place they used to be. Uh, Maybe your body is struggling with an illness uh, of some sort. Maybe your body isn't the size you'd like it to be. Maybe it's just not functioning the way that it used to. Does any of that ring true for any of you? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? It does for me. Now, just say I had this selection of new bodies all up here on a rack. 
like a clothes rack, but new bodies, and they're fit and healthy ones, who would be keen to replace the body that they have? Show me your hands. Yeah, all the honest people put up their hands. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, most of you would know that I broke my ankle a few years ago. And since then, I've turned 40. I know I don't look it. Um, <laughs> and things just aren't the same as they used to be, right? And even though I've been going to the gym and I've been working out, I'm just not as fit and healthy as I would like my body to be. I've got knees that have endured 30 years of netball. Um, you know, I've got uneven muscle tone on either side of my body. I've got scoliosis happening in my upper spine, and I just don't look as young as I used to. So if I'm being honest this morning, and probably a bit superficial, <laughs> if it was an option, I think now would be a really good time for an upgrade. And I'm not talking about Kyle, all right? <laughs> don't need to upgrade him, he's pretty good. Upgrade my body. Um, and I know that there are a few of you who would opt for that too. But we don't have that option, do we? Uh, I know that there are people who get Botox and they're getting facelifts and they're getting tummy tucks and lip fillers and eyelash extensions and body enhancement surgeries. But all of that, even with uh, regular exercise and a great diet, and you know those will help you live a healthier life, so those two are good. Um, we will continue to deteriorate until our time is finished earthside. Now, that's probably not what you want to hear, but it's probably not new information to you either. But I do have some good news for you this morning. Not all hope is lost, okay? We're told in the Bible that when our earthly body ceases to exist, and that is the reality for all people, we will each die when the time comes. But the good news is that when our bodies die, we will be given a new body to live in. How cool is that? Get excited, church, get excited. Because you get a new body, and you get a new body, and you get a new body, and everybody gets a new body. I've just always wanted to do that. So thank you, thank you very much, thank you very much. When your time earthside comes to an end, that is when your new body upgrade becomes available. So watch this, 2 Corinthians 5.1. For we know that when this earthly tent, now what's an earthly tent? That's a metaphor for our bodies. We know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present bodies. How many of you grow weary sometimes in your present body? And we long to put on our heavenly bodies like new clothing. For we will put on heavenly bodies. We will not be spirits without bodies. While we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and we sigh. But it's not that we want to get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this. And as a guarantee, he has given us his Holy Spirit. How awesome is that? When we have finished earth's side of eternity, our earthly bodies will cease to exist. They will die. But though the physical body ceases to be alive, we'll be raised up and we'll be given new bodies. And that excites me because I think Paul just nails it. He says, you know, while we live in these earthly bodies, we groan and we sigh. And though some of us do that uh, more than others, I'm sure... All of us have groaned and sighed at some point. And I don't know about you, but it helps me to know that I have a replacement body to look forward to. Hopefully not too soon. Um, but nonetheless, our hope is in the promise that one day when we die, we will be restored with a new body. Now, I'm sure most of you are not super thrilled about the idea of having to die to get a new body. But since it's inevitable there might as well be an upside, right? So I think it's a pretty sweet deal. Uh, but perhaps you would like to know how that happens. You know, if we're honest, the concept is a little bit out of our grasp of understanding. Uh, but Paul, he knows that some people will be asking these questions. And so in 1 Corinthians 15, 35 to 36, Paul addresses this and he writes, 
But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? Now, unfortunately, Paul isn't very gracious in his response. Verse 36, he responds, how foolish. I think that maybe that was Paul's way of saying, I actually don't know the finer details. And since we're talking about spiritual things, we don't really need to know how God does it. We just need to know that he does. And honestly, if you would ask me those questions this morning, that is how I would respond. I would say to you that actually, I can't give you the finer details. But the Bible does have a bit to say about it. So let's just look at some more scriptures and just let it speak to us. So the Apostle Paul actually continues in 1 Corinthians 15 and he goes on to say, What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he is determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and star differs from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, that's our current body. It is raised imperishable, that's our new body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So Paul is speaking of our current bodies and our new bodies, and we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. But how's it done? Philippians 3, 20, 21, Paul writes, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will do what? He will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. So how, it, how is it done? Jesus will do it. That's what we need to know today. Jesus will transform our earthly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And Pastor Pete told us last week, Jesus, when he died on the cross and then beat death and was resurrected, he did not come back a ghost or a spirit without a body. Uh, We're told that the disciples touched his hands and Jesus ate food and his body was of a physical nature. Now we read earlier that we will put on heavenly bodies, we will not be spirits without bodies. So we're likely not going to be see-through and ghostly, uh, but what we read in these passages is that our perishable earthly bodies will be raised imperishable. Our mortal bodies will be clothed with immortality. And what we have here is a picture of our earthly versus heavenly, and natural versus spiritual, perishable versus imperishable. Our new body will be heavenly, spiritual, and imperishable, unlike our current earthly, natural, and perishable bodies. And that kind of just reminds me of an eco-friendly product, right? You see on the front of the box, earthly, natural, biodegradable. And essentially we are, right? Our bodies are. We were created from the dust and to the dust it will return. But our our new bodies will be different. Um, Wayne Grudem, or Grudem, sorry if, if I pronounced it incorrectly, he's a theologian. And he said this about our new bodies. He said, the fact that our new bodies will be imperishable means that they will not wear out or grow old or ever be subject to any kind of sickness or disease. They will be completely healthy and strong forever. Moreover, since the gradual process of aging is part of the process by which our bodies now are subject to corruption, it is appropriate to think that our resurrection bodies will have no sign of aging, but will have the characteristics of youthful but mature manhood or womanhood forever. There will be no evidence of disease or injury, for all will be made perfect." Our resurrection bodies will show the fulfillment of God's perfect wisdom in creating us as human beings who are the pinnacle of his creation and the appropriate bearers of his likeness and image. 
In these resurrection bodies, we will clearly see humanity as God intended it to be. And everyone over 40 says, Amen. As Christians, our hope is not placed in these temporary bodies. These bodies will eventually succumb to decay and mortality. We know that. Death is a part of life. But instead, our hope is anchored in the promise of a glorious future, a future where we will receive new, imperishable bodies transformed into the likeness of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And so while we may experience suffering and frailty in this life, we can look forward with eager anticipation to the day when we'll be made new, fully restored in body, soul, and spirit. And this hope that we have, it helps sustain us through every trial and tribulation, knowing that our present sufferings, and, and I don't want to minimize this for anyone this morning, or what you may be going through, but in the eternal picture, our present sufferings are temporary compared to the eternal glory that awaits us in our new body that God has prepared for us. Yes, we still need to manage the body that we have now. And this body has its own splendor. But the good news is that when the time comes, the upgrade will become available. And you'll get a new body. And you'll get a new body. And you'll get a new body. And everybody will get a new body. So what does that mean for our current bodies? Do we just give up on these ones and say you know what, well, it doesn't matter what I do with this one, it's going to be replaced eventually. No, I don't think so. Uh, I've got a few biblical reasons why, let me share them with you. So the first one is that our bodies are a gift from God. All right, these ones that we're wearing now, we've been created in his image and are intended for his glory. So Genesis 1.27, so God created human beings in his own image, in the image of God, he created them. By treating our bodies with reverence and stewardship, we honour God the creator with, who made us um, and we recognise his sovereignty over our lives. Secondly, as Christians, we also believe that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, uh, indwelt by God himself. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20, don't you realise that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honour God with your body. So caring for our bodies is not only an act of self-respect, but also an act of reverence for the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. Thirdly, God has a purpose and a plan for each of our lives. Um, our bodies are the instruments through which we can fulfill his purpose. So Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. He has plans for us in the here and the now. And by maintaining our physical health and well-being, we're better equipped to serve God and better equipped to serve others effectively. And then the fourth reason today, and it, the fourth reason comes back to the hope that we have in the restoration of our bodies. Now, while our current bodies are subject to decay and mortality, we have the hope of receiving new imperishable bodies in the future. And so by taking care of our bodies in the present, through healthy living, self-discipline, by the avoidance of sinful behaviours, we align ourselves with God's desire for wholeness and holiness. We're preparing ourselves for the future glory that awaits us. And this preparation involves physical and spiritual aspects. Our bodies are not separate, separate from um, our spiritual selves, but are rather interconnected. As Christians... We should be aiming to live in a way that acknowledges the temporary nature of our current bodies, honours God with our physical selves, and anticipates the future hope of receiving new glorified bodies in the resurrection. So do we stop eating healthy and start bumming around? No, keep working out, keep treating it well with good food, keep aiming to live a holy life in obedience to God. And if you're not currently doing these things, and perhaps this is a good time to assess 
and maybe make some changes. Now, why do we even need new bodies? I hear you ask. What a great question. Well, they need to last for all of eternity. And I think we've established that these ones aren't going to cut it, right? Um, the Bible tells us that there will be a time when there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Now, remember the passage from Revelation where John tells us that he saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. God's plan is to bring restoration and transformation to the entire created order, free from sin and suffering. Now, sin has had and continues to have an impact on the earth and all creation, but God has a plan for restoration. And we're going to need those bodies to enjoy the presence of God and to partake in everything that he has prepared for us on the other side of eternity. Now, from the scriptures, we're told that we're going to enjoy the company of people from every tribe and nation and tongue. We'll enjoy a new earth that would be much like the Garden of Eden before sin um, corrupted it. And it's very likely that there's going to be delicious food um, because we read about banquets and fruits and possibly even going to be wine. But honestly, we don't know exactly what it's going to look like on the other side of this life. But we have confident hope that it's going to be more magnificent than anything we can ever imagine. There will be no more death, no mourning, no crying, no pain, and God will dwell among his people. And that will be so much more amazing than what we might think. God has given us a gift of life now on this earth with these bodies in this time. And sometimes it's just beautiful and you can see all the blessings around us. But I know that sometimes it's also really hard. And tough, painful stuff happens and we experience pain, whether it be emotional or physical. And you might be struggling with life right now. You know, and that breaks my heart to know that people struggle. And I don't want to at all minimise what you're going through this morning but instead, I want to encourage you and, I say, and say, even though you still need to navigate a life on this side of eternity, you can have hope and take comfort that God is with you in it and through it even now. And on top of that, you can have the hope that if you are a believer, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, then our hope continues beyond the here and now and into the future and even into eternity as we have the promise of eternal life with a new body and a new heaven and a new earth where you won't need to suffer anymore. And as I wrap up this morning, you guys have been really great, thank you. I just want to chat with you briefly about one more thing and that is death. Now, all of what we've just spoken about takes place on the other side of death. And I know that for many, there's a real fear of death. And, you know, that is completely normal. But as believers, it doesn't have to be that way. As believers, we're encouraged to view our death not with fear, but with joy at the prospect of going to be with Christ. Now, Paul says, we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. When he's in prison and he's not knowing if uh, he'll be executed or released, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, that's the new body. That's being in God's presence. If it is to be life in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which should I choose? I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and to be with Christ, for that is far better. And then John also writes about death in Revelation. He says, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they are blessed indeed, for they will rest from their hard work, for their good deeds follow them. As believers, we can approach death differently to the world. The moment that our bodies die will be in the presence 
of God, for to be absent from the body is to be present with Jesus. And Jesus himself said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus says, I will come back and take you to be with me and that you also may be where I am. Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you. That is the hope that we have today, church. A new heaven, a new earth, a new body, eternity in the presence of Jesus in a place that he has prepared for us. Let's pray. God, we're just so thankful because we know that you're always at work, even right now, in our lives and in the world around us. Holy Spirit, would you stir within us that deep understanding that this world isn't our final stop. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on the eternal realities of your kingdom, where true restoration and lasting joy are found. Lord, in this world where everything seems so temporary, would you give us the wisdom to see what truly matters? Help us to invest our time, energy and resources in things that will last for eternity. Give, our heart, give us hearts that beat with yours, hearts that ache for the brokenness and the pain around us, but also leap for joy at the work of your redemption and your re restoration. And God, every day, would you remind us of your ultimate purpose, of our ultimate purpose, to bring glory to your name and to dwell with you forever. May we live each day with a sense of urgency, knowing that our time here is short and that we're called to make the most of every opportunity to advance your kingdom and to bring hope to the hopeless. We lift all these prayers in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Let us stand and worship, church.
the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. great line for us to finish our time together on let's take that into our week that we have unending love and amazing grace that God has given us that God has given each of us to take into this week so may he bless you as you go Uh, as we close our service we've got morning tea so please enjoy catching up together over that if you could take your communion cups those ones that we struggle with and pop them in the bin that'd be awesome and no hurry But if you have a chance after you've had morning tea, we do need to pack all these chairs away to help the guys with the lighting for this week. But let's go, loving God, loving people, that together we might be a flourishing community of hope. May God bless you.